Deborah, with her 30 years of being an entrepreneur and creating over seven companies, knows exactly what it means to accept the mission. When you make that decision, when you accept the mission to become a solopreneur, to take yourself and your talents to market, then you embrace a life of not only unlimited possibilities, but also the unknown. It's an elixir of fear and bravery that only someone who's taken the leap really understands. On our show, Deb digs deep with her guests to highlight what you, the listener, wants to know. The stories, the whys, and the hows to navigate the journey to success. Get ready to hear from some of the most incredible mission takers from Generation Z to Boomers. So sit up, perk up, and get ready to be blown away. Now here is your host, Deborah Drummond. Welcome back, you amazing audience. Seriously, if you accidentally went, mission accepted, I wonder what this is about, you are in for a treat. If you're here, you're meant to be here. And you know people that are meant to listen to this interview once we go through this interview with D. Lipping. Well, I am no, I don't, you know, I'm gonna, I'm so excited. I'm not excited, I'm honored. This is a woman of great respect in her craft and otherwise. And you need to pass this on. Now, you guys know that I think you're the best audience, even when people have podcasts, you know, they're sitting as my guests. I still say you guys are the best audience then I always give you something else. Well, I'm telling you, you guys are rock stars today. You are frigging rock stars. Um, and if you've just shown up again, what we do here is we talk about the mission, why people take it, why they stay, which is sometimes more important, why they stay. Is there something in you that makes you wanna try something on the side, full time, completely change your life? Is there a mission inside that you're kind of like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Because sometimes we get forced into our mission and sometimes it's a choice. Um, we have Dee Lippingwell with us today. And if you don't know Dee, then you don't know music. <laughs> because this woman has taken more pictures of the most iconic, iconic, rock and roll musicians I've ever seen. I mean, I'm looking at the front of her magazine or her book here, not magazine, and you got Ted Nugent going to town and you've got everyone in here. You've got Stevie Nicks. You've got, oh my gosh, look at everybody in here. You've got Sting. You've got, I mean, I mean, you know what? I'm going to let you tell people, everyone that's in here, but it just goes on and on and on. I've been looking at these books because look at, there's one and then there's two and then there's three. I mean, it is incredible. So, um, Miss D. Lippingwell, thank you for joining us today on Mission Accepted. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Four decades. Four decades. Almost five. Uh, who's counting? Who's I don't counting? know. You know I don't when know you're there's going to be lots of there's going to be lots of books here. Uh, there's going to be so many books. Wow. And of course, Buble, Olivia Newton John. Wow. Clay Aiken. Mm. Okay. Celine Dion. Now look at that. 1991 Junos. Okay. Um, so clearly you've had a life of photography. Yes, I have. I <laughs> uh, started that out as just a hobby for my own personal use, satisfaction, uh, memories. And then just evolved and just had people behind me, you know, saying, go, go for it, go for it. You have an eye, go for it, go for it. And uh, trials and tribulations, I did enjoy it. And it, 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 I, it aroused something in me. It made me excited. I was working in the medical field and which, you know, it was, you know, I have an arthritic finger because of it, I think, right? Um, right. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it just took on a life of its own, let's just say that. It and did, you know what I think? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like to encapsulate that a little bit because I just said sometimes you're at the back of the wall, sometimes you need to make a leap into another career because you know your company has been taken over by another company or what have you. And then there's the, the passion hobby that grows and grows and grows as you grow and grow and grow. And it's almost like something that you have to do, you know, whether it's a hobby, whether it's just, and then there's many times where something that starts off and people are like, could I, 
could like I really make a living out of doing this? And many situations, it's other people going, oh my gosh, you paint amazing. Or, oh my gosh, no one bakes bread like you. Or, oh my gosh, like, look at the clothes that you make for yourself. You should be making those for other people, right? What, what was the turning point for you? When did you go, hmm, I'm going to do this? I think after my, I think after my very first show, uh, um, and it wasn't actually a show, it was just a, I walked into a, I walked into a, a record store and they had a, a Pink Floyd concert, which I had been at because I went with my brother and I happened to take my camera and I bought a 500 millimeter lens, which I could not hold. So, um, I mean, I'm getting my brother to hold the lens up. I'm trying to shoot this band. And I knew of the band, right? Because he had turned me on to them. But um, I took off my took off my 500 millimeter, put on my regular, went down, shot the show, and then those pictures were awesome. I don't know. It was like it was my third eye. And uh, I walked into this record store, and they had a display of Pink Floyd concert photos. And I guffawed. I went. <laughs> Um, you know, if you're going to do a display, make sure that you've got good pictures. And of course, the, the the manager said, I suppose you have better. And I said, I suppose I do. He said, well, <laughs> if you do, you, you know, bring them in. And I raced home and 15 minutes later, I was back and I had the, the package of like five by seven color pictures and he's leaving through them and he go, you took these? And I went, yeah. He goes, what's your name? And I told him, he goes, is that your like stage name or your photographer's <laughs> name? And I went, no, that's my name. And he said, do you mind if I put these on display? I said, no. He said, yeah, well, he got his girl to type out, you know, on the fax machine or something, um, D. Lippingwell. And um, he the poor other photographer, I don't know who it was, but he took all his pictures down because they were awful. They were like black and white blobs, white blobs, black, you know, you couldn't even see who the artist was. And that was my first, that was my first inkling that, wow, maybe I, maybe this is what I was meant to do. Yeah. And then just, and I had the people behind me saying, wow, like, look at these, you know, uh, you know, people were saying, oh, look, I'm getting goosebumps. You've captured such a great moment. And so I just continued on and I practiced and I practiced and I set up my own dark room and I had already, you know, taught myself, you know, how to print my pictures. So um, I was into trees and flowers and, you know, stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. but when I went, cause I was always an avid concert goer and after, and I had an Instamatic, I didn't even have a 35 millimeter. Um, I mean, really, I mean, it's like, <laughs> well, um, and, I had, I had, I just had no idea that I could, I could do it. I, it was, it was, wow. Like I go and I take the picture that were like, wow. You no, know, I go to clubs and I, you know, and I would be at the back or at the back wall or whatever. And just trying to remember, you know, moves or stuff like this or how I was feeling because that's basically how I shoot, as I shoot with, when I feel the music in here. If I don't feel the music in here, I'm sorry. It just doesn't come across. I have mm -hmm. to feel it. And when I feel it, it transcends into my camera somehow. And, and then when I'm in the dark room and I see it developing and I go, wow, wow, I took that picture, right? Uh, it's It was just, it was love. I, I had, I, I had developer fluid in my veins instead of blood, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it was, you know, I, I didn't care lack of sleep because I was working day jobs, my day job. And I was going out to clubs and, you know, it was like, uh, well, can I get in for free? Yeah, you can get in for free. Yeah. I want to take some pictures. I'll give them to you. Right. So all the club owners, they were quite, they were quite happy to see me because I'd come back and I'd give them pictures of the bands playing there, right? Mm -hmm. Which they really appreciated, and even to this day, right? We're talking about doing a book on um, Club Soda, right? Of all the pictures that I took there, but oh, Club Soda. yeah, at Club Soda, lots of people remember Club Soda. Uh, <laughs> um, um, 
anyway, it's, it, you know, like I said, it did take on a life of its own, but um, I didn't, I wasn't sleep deprived. If I was in the dark room till three o'clock in the morning and having to get up at seven, I didn't feel sleep deprived because I was doing something that was exciting. It was like every time that picture, that image emerged, it was, you know, I get goosebumps, right? And then teaching me all, myself all the dark room work too. I, I actually uh, was taught through Time Life books. They had a whole series of books and um, I, I stumbled across these and they were just like pictures, how to do this, how to do that. And I just followed them to the T and I kept all these notes and well, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, yeah, it was like every roll of film I developed, I would put down, you know, the temperature of the fluid and the, you know, I mean, it was like how many times I agitated it per minute and, you know, it was like it was scientific as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, it's that's that's how that's how it started, and it just continued. And when I told when I told, like I had to go, I had to create work for myself, and I knew it was out there, but I knew most of it was taken up by a man. So I approached mm -hmm. the record companies. And, uh, you know, and I begged, bored, stole, um, you know, can you, can I get into this show? Can I get into that show? Uh, not shooting. I mean, well, I, I was shooting. I was shooting from the crowd. Right. right. Um, right. And, you know, can I help you? Do you have any gold album presentations? And I went to every, every record label in town, right? And said, you know, <laughs> excuse me, um, this is me right? This is my work. You know? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody was hiring me. And um, I had the job at the Georgia Strait, which was like $5 a picture, and you didn't get published every week. And, you know, some months you made like $15. So it's like, you know, I had to teach myself how to do wedding photography and how to do modeling photography and lighting and, you know, the whole, you know, the whole, the whole ball of wax. I was like, Anyway, I'm, am I talking to you? <laughs> no, no, you're not talking too much. But I think that, um, first of all, I love Club Soda because I used to, that was one of the clubs we had Club Courtesy with because I used to work in the clubs in beautiful Vancouver. And Club Soda, for those of you who don't know, was just an incredible club in downtown Vancouver that did have a number of uh, bands. And it was just a great place oh, to go. Yeah. And I think, no, I don't think, I mean, I, the one thing I love about your um, experience, right? Cause it's, you know, it's your story is that there is very much an organic flow. It, it had its own um, push, but it was like, it was pushing you. I mean, it made you go search things out. I think that, you know, some people are really, really fortunate that they have that drive inside, but the, the drive makes them not tired in the morning. The drive makes them contact people they're afraid of the, the the drive makes them walk into a room when you know the odds are against them and and I think that um too many times people are in their head when it comes to entrepreneurship and they need to be in their body and they need to let the passion lead them right and I when I hear you talk I just hear you talk about how the passion led you and it led you here and it led you there and um it kind of spoke to you I mean it's such a I mean such a creative art and then when you were at Georgia Strait, I remember you sharing that story about how good you were getting five bucks a picture, you know, and, you know, what does that look like? Obviously, that looks like a full time job somewhere else because you can't sustain on that and just trying to um, make your craft come alive enough to that sustainable. When when did it flip? Like how long? I mean, like you said, almost five decades. When did your business flip over to being able to sustain you? Uh, it was, it took about, it took about five years. Mm -hmm. oh, excuse me. It took about five years of me working my day job, going out, working for the record companies and working for promoters around town. And I worked hard, uh, but I went to one promoter and I said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about quitting my day job because I think I've got it. So now that I have enough income coming in um, that I can, that I can handle it. And he laughed at me and he said, I guess he didn't know me very well because he said, I, 
you're not going to make a living from shooting rock bands. The musicians don't want them and the promoters already get them from the band managers and you're not going to make a living from it. And I said, watch me. <laughs> watch me. Don't say that I can't do something. What are you talking about? Right? Yeah. Yeah, I can do this. And he just, he went, Bleh. and even to this day, he sees me and he shakes his head. And he goes, <laughs> oh, I, I I knew you could do it all along, D. I was just pulling your leg, right? Uh-huh. Right. Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, look, I know that you have a lot of stories inside and a lot of incredible moments. Is there is there anything that, you know, I'm sure there's a flood of incredible moments, but can you share with us? uh some moments that like made it all work you know has made it all worth it or was it was really fulfilling to you or a kind of a magical moment while you were doing your work well when tina turner requested that i do her book tour uh press in vancouver that was pretty much jaw-dropping right mm. you know asking for me personally well she didn't actually ask for D. Lippingwell, she asked for that photographer who did the album thing, who did all the interviews for the album thing, you know, the one with the great legs. <laughs> nice job, Tina. Nice job. Um, and and of course, the record rep went, oh, that's D. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that so yeah, that, and then and then when we actually we did all the interviews and I did with her and she was she, she walked into the hotel room where we were doing them and she said, oh, I'm so glad they found you. And I looked at her and I went, you're wearing pants. We were supposed to have our legs, a picture of our leg. She said, oh, you have much better legs than me, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Which wasn't true. But, yeah. Oh my gosh. I oh, mean, that's she yeah, she, but she, you know, she's actually one of the only artists that shushed me, right? You know, that's enough. Mm -hmm. It's you know, on, on David Bowie, his, his, he did that too to me. He, he shushed me, but uh, Tina went, that's enough, because I was, I was so excited. This was when she released um, uh, one of her albums, and she was here, and she wasn't doing a tour anywhere and she was doing all these interviews and they rented this place in in um uh falls creek <coughs> uh, before it was even you know it was like an old warehouse and they decked it all out and for the first interview i think it was terry david Mulligan um was interviewing her and i was just like click 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 right and she 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 put her hand on on Terry's arm and much music right she she said and she looked at me and went that's enough I think, right. I think you've got it so uh, so and I was like oh sheepish I was sheepish <laughs> and there you go but, and then she but, requested you yeah yeah wow do you have any other stories of people that uh, you took that there was a special moment there for you or? Um, you um, well, I worked, I worked for many, 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 many years with Long John Baldry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, you know, the whole, the Rod Stewart and that whole mm -hmm. thing is pretty special to me. Um, you know, it's, this, this, the stories are, you have to read the stories. You have to read the stories because the stories are things that actually happened to me and I'm telling it like it was and I can take you there. And um, one of the things that people say about you know the stories in the book is, I was at that concert. I think I saw you shooting in the pit or, you know, Alice Cooper fell on me. Dee, are you all right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> It's famous. It's famous. It's mm -hmm. Dallas Cooper falling off the stage in Vancouver is a famous story. And mm -hmm. a lot of people know that he fell on me. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was okay. Right? Yeah. But they made me sign a waiver um, <laughs> saying that if he fell off the stage again and fell on me, that I wouldn't sue. <laughs> Why would I sue? Why there, would there's I sue? a prime example of 
um, when you're building a business, uh, you don't know what you don't know until it happens. You're like, okay, we didn't know we would have to do a stage falling contract NDA or, you know, um, so exactly. let's do that, shall we? Well, Sting thought I was stalking him because I met him in the lobby with my book, my first book. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like, did he think that we were stupid in Vancouver that we wouldn't know where he would be staying? I mean, <laughs> hello. <laughs> but he came down really hard on the on the record rep. She's stalking me. This is the third time that I've seen her. Well, I was doing the, I was doing shoot for the f photography for the record companies. Of course, he saw me before, but that yeah. turns into stalking. I don't think so. And he was in my book, right? He did sign <laughs> the book. He did sign the book, though. You know, and I think you know it's sort of an apology to me, but yeah, you know, I mean, there's, there's so well, the stories in the book just show that you can. <laughs> You can be successful, but, you know, you have to be ready to accept the fact that you're going to have a couple of running shoes in your mouth at some moment in time, right? Absolutely. Or do something really stupid. And most of the stories are funny about the stupid things that I've done meeting these people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you must be talking about this book here. First three songs, no, no class, class, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the one that's got all these incredible stories. I was just looking at, um, you know, Anne and Nancy, you know, you did some you did some touring with heart. I did. I did. Imagine riding in a jet down to Seattle all by myself. Oh, my God. It was incredible. Right. And then we picked them up in Seattle. The jet picked them up in Seattle. And Howard was def deathly afraid of flying. We were only going to Portland, right? And he just sat there the whole time. And, ah. <laughs> My aunt and Nancy are fabulous. Um, uh, I don't, uh, that was probably the first time that I was made aware of some of the stupidity of some of the interviewers and the people who are writers who all asked exactly the same question. Right. Mm -hmm. And did it was obvious that they'd only read, read part way down on the bio and they didn't mm -hmm. continue. Right. You know, and Anna and Nancy were just so gracious and so kind and so warm and tried to defer them to actual like song making, right, writing lyrics, doing who does the music. Like, you know, it was like, mm -hmm. so do you think that, um, uh, being married to two guys in the band is uh, helpful to you or him or, or a hindrance? <laughs> like, what, what, number one, what business is it of yours? And number two, what does that have to do with our songwriting skills or, or the band skills as, as musicians? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I did go on tour. Yeah, I did go on tour as easy to uh, uh, taking Texas to the world tour. Um, I wasn't allocated to where the cows were, but you know, I was, uh, <laughs> that was, the, I had to rest for three weeks. I, I was only on the road for seven days. It was the longest seven days of my life. Um, uh, you know, you go to different, you go to three different cities and you don't know the cities and you have to find a place that's going to develop your film like in an hour, unheard mm -hmm. of, like we're, like, you know, so I had, you know, roadies like driving me around, you know, Dallas. I was like, oh, God, where are we? <laughs> right. And CZ Top were really, really upset when the first book came out, Best Seat in the House, and they weren't in it. Uh, they were, they said, D, we took you on tour. <laughs> you were our tour photographer for a week. Right. Uh, you know, the management. I said, well, look, OK, that tour, that actual tour thing was um, you hired me, you paid me. The film was yours. I didn't even I, uh, I didn't get it. You got it all. And the management said, well, we would have shown it to you. We would have given it to you if you'd asked. Right. So I said, OK, no problem. So I think I wrote that story in first few <laughs> songs anyway. <laughs> but they mean, you know, it's isn't it interesting, right? Uh you can't make everybody happy and you know it's interesting but um yes in this one I'm looking at George Michael you know I mean I think the cool oh. thing about reading something like this or uh, getting to know the artist more is that 
it gives you more depth to your experience with them. You know, right. like my son's 19 and he came in the kitchen, I don't know, maybe six months ago. He goes, mom, I found this new band. I'm like, sweet. You know, we're a bit of a music. I'm like, put it on. And he's playing. I'm like, Ocean, that's the Thompson twins. <laughs> you know, that's the Thompson twins, right? And um, we're coming back from my daughter's. We're driving back from mission. So it's about an hour. And he's like, mom, I just found this music for my playlist. And I'm like, okay. And I'm expecting, you know, because he's he's he loves all music, but I'm I'm not expecting this. And he goes, listen to these guys. And he puts it on. It's the Bee Gees. I'm like, <laughs> Ocean, okay, you know what? I think we need to tell you some things about these artists, right? But once you get to know the artist, like when you when I read the stories that you have in here, I feel more connected to the memories that that music gives me. Exactly, exactly. That, mm -hmm. That's how, how I meant it to be all along, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is this is historical. This is lineage. This well, is it's, um, it's 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 not um it's not dated. It's not dated. It's not like oh, you put you published this book how many years ago? They're still the stories are still re relevant today because now we're more interested in those artists mm -hmm. and what they were like, right? I mean, now I'm working on now my slides to do another book. It'll probably mm -hmm. take me five years. It'll keep me busy. Um, uh, you know, um, my <laughs> so ask, somebody asked me what the title was going to be, and I said, "Well, I don't have a title, but after looking at some of these." photographs it should be rock stars before wrinkles <laughs> <laughs> okay if that's not the name of the book it darn well needs to be a t-shirt in your merchandise line i mean that's that's I will, bomb th yeah, this <laughs> person is in marketing and he said boy talk about grab attention right you know he said a great marketing tool yeah rock stars before wrinkles <laughs> I said well I wanted it to be a little bit more you know grown up or something he goes no 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 he said no go for it go for it so yeah you know I don't, I don't know if we I don't know if we need to grow up um, no, you, you don't. You've got your scarf around your neck. So I just think that this is incredible. So tell us about your scarf because I mean okay, this was this was a long time in the making because people I couldn't get across to people that I wanted on a soft, silky material, and I wanted to put six photos on one side and six different photos on the other side at the bottom. Um they 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 these designers just couldn't get it through their head and mm -hmm. finally I met this wonderful woman and she said I had made one up I'd actually got the silk I I, I printed out the pictures right I glued them onto the silk this is, okay <laughs> this is what I want and she said well no problem how come people haven't been able to I said I don't know. so we decided this material is made out of 100% uh, I go back here. Oh, little. there you go. Fantastic, though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this may this material is really light, lightweight. It's made out of uh hundred percent recycled water bottles. Mm -hmm. And it has all my favorite artists on Stevie Nicks, you know, Mick Jagger, Sting, Elton, uh, Steven Tyler, Rod Stewart on one side, and on the other, we have Pete Townsend, we got Tom Petty, Tina Turner. Uh, David Bowie, who am I missing? Bruce Springsteen, Bruce, Eric, yeah. So, yeah. And not only for women, but for men. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got uh, right now uh, uh, an artist who is wearing my scarf on stage. So it's like, oh, send me a photo. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Now you're, now uh, you're saying send me a you photo. Know, you know, I mean, I have, I have a picture of, Rod Stewart reading my book. Somebody sent me a picture of Rod Stewart reading my book. And you you can't really see his face, but you know it's Rod Stewart, the hair, the you know, you see a portion <laughs> of it. Right? But he's engrossed. And it's like, oh. So get an artist to wear something on stage, and then I can take a picture of it, and then I can flog it. But these are very exclusive. Yeah. Yeah, these are exclusive. Um, yeah. um we we made we made 50. wow yeah we made 50 um and i signed them right and um so we so we don't have very many left 
Uh, but we we have enough. I think we have about twenty left, right? Because okay. I haven't really been flogging them, right? Yeah. Uh, no. Just doing other things. Doing other things. Living living life. <laughs> um, so look, as we kind of wrap up, and as we come off our podcast, going, I want your life. Um, <laughs> you know the truth, right? Okay, like seriously. Um, the truth of uh, running your own business, getting told no. What was what was the toughest part for you and how did you overcome that? So there's a lot of people that are listening that, I mean, and we do that, right? After you've been, after you've kind of been in the sawmill for a while, I call it, people think you become um, not untouchable, but things don't affect you, that you don't have, you don't have things. I think it was the financial, the, the actual, the financial aspect of it. That, that was the most difficult part because mm -hmm. At some time, you know, like I didn't, it, there wasn't a, okay, here's your paycheck for this week. It was like everything that I made, it had to come in. And if I couldn't make the rent, it was like, okay, now what am I going to do? Okay, well, I have two cameras and I had a really good understanding with a pawn shop. And then I would take one camera into the pawn shop and they would, they would say, how much do you want? I had to set up a, you know, a rapport mm -hmm. with them, of course, you know, I need, I need a hundred dollars. So this is a $400 camera. So I need a hundred dollars and I want to only want to pawn it for 10 days. And then they charge you like two bucks. Right. And I would come yeah. back and I would have, because I would be waiting for a check from A&M records or CBS records or whatever. And as soon as that check came in, then I would go and I would get my camera. Out. Well, I did this a lot. Right. Because nothing yeah. was nothing was for sure, but there was no way that I was going to um, not not do my not do what I was doing. Mm -hmm. it didn't even enter my head. It was just like, okay, we got this this purple patch, and we just get over that, and we just continue on. Yeah, and people, I think that's you know, yeah. People people should should not be afraid or be no. very afraid. <laughs> but, but you know, here's the interesting thing. Here you are, right? Here you are and here you'll be. And I think that, um, you know, entrepreneurship, whatever that looks like for people, right? I mean, uh, sometimes people think that being a musician or being an, a photographer or being in the arts isn't entrepreneurship, but it's entrepreneurship. I mean, you got to sell yourself and what you do, right? So it's the same thing that we do in the world of entrepreneurship. But, and then a lot of times it is, you hear like, oh, the money and, and, and it's hard to explain to people that there will be thin times, but you will get through it because that's the time that you get the most resourceful. Like you have resources. You just haven't had to put them to task because maybe you've had a paycheck every two weeks or whatever. But the funny thing is everybody still ends up standing at the end of the day, right? Everyone ends up standing at the end of the day. So I think that's when you dig deep. That's when you dig deep. All right. So here's something really interesting. So um, first of all, I know that in the show notes, people are going to be able to go to your site. You've got all your books there. You've got your scarves there. You've got some incredible photography to look at. And we do want to make sure that people understand it's dlippingwell.ca right? Because this woman right. lives in, oh gosh, am I so lucky Vancouver, Canada? Mm, where do I live? So that's cool and groovy. <laughs> yay, for, yay for me. Good decision. Um, good, you know, good call on my parents, I guess. But um, one question I have for you is the same question that I ask every single person that comes onto the show. And it relates to my love to music. Um, not so much about entrepreneurship. I don't even know how you're going to answer this one, or maybe it's going to come off super, super fast. But my question to you is if you're on your way to a desert island, that's it. You're checking out. It's There's an island and there's you and one suitcase. And you have room in that suitcase for just one album because we know it's going to be an album. Um, what album are you taking with you that you couldn't imagine not listening to for the rest of your days? Uh, the band that started it all, you're going to be surprised, Pink Floyd. <laughs> nice. The band that started I got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Pink Floyd. And any any one of their albums, it, it doesn't make any difference. 
you yeah. know, whatever, whatever. It's yeah. It's it's so. incredible music. It's incredible music. Well, look, we're well, so a surprise because my first album actually was Frank Sinatra. I'll do it my way, or I did it my way, or whatever. Yeah, you know, that was my first album. My second album was Pink Floyd. So, well, you know, I gotta say, T, knowing you a little bit now. I'm not that surprised that you were attracted to an album called I Do It My Way. I'm not, I'm not, think, I'm not thinking that's just too far off for you. I'm not thinking, you know, someone who walks into Georgia Strait and, you know, Gildoff is sitting there and, and you know, you go and go, hey, you need to buy my pictures kind of thing. Um, no, I'm thinking that you that think that you own that. I think that it's funny. I just went and bought a Sammy Davis Jr. album not too long ago. Oh, my heavens. Oh, excellent. Yeah, 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 pretty good. Is he dancing and, on it? <laughs> um, no, but and my son wanted to buy Eddie Money. Remember Eddie Money? Oh, oh of course. Oh, yeah. Two tickets to paradise. Two tickets to paradise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We could go on all day, but we're going to come back when you have your next book ready. And, and probably more before then, because we can't can't wait five years for it. No. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, Anything to say before we sign off and let these rock stars? No, uh, blah, 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 blah. no, 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 nothing. Okay. Just go to my website, check it out. You know, if you okay. see if you see anything you like, just you know, if you want to talk to me, you can go through my website. I can always be reached through lippingwell at gmail.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, so you can, you know. I, I, I do get a lot of Facebook uh, friend requests. Uh, some of them I sort of totally ignore because they're stationed in Iraq or they're, you know, in Belgium. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, there's lots of ways to get in touch with me. And I don't mind talking to people and I don't mind giving advice. Don't quit your day job. <laughs> don't quit your day job so you're making more than $5 a photo, people. Yeah, you hear exactly. That? Yeah, exactly. Um, wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today, Dee. And look, you guys, you're incredible. I love you. You're the best audience ever. And now that we're talking about music a little bit, um, you guys know what I'm going to talk about next. I'm going to send you to datedatour.ca. So that's the big walk that myself and my girlfriend, Corrine, are going to be trekking across Ireland to raise money for the music community. And look, at you don't have to do the eight marathons. We're just asking that you go to the donate page. And, and this is what I say. I say, clear your music karma. All this money that we need.